Hi everybody, Mike here, and I have a little confession I need to make to you. After nearly seven years now of traveling around North America, when it comes to maintenance and do-it-yourself repairs, this thing intimidates me. If you're a regular viewer, you know that uh, I'm not allowed to pick up a screwdriver or a hammer when Jennifer's around. I'm just not a very handy handyman. Well, I decided that it was time for me to just suck it up and uh, get with the program. So we actually went to Canada to the headquarters of the Irwin Heimer Group of North America, where we got an expert to tell me about the preventative maintenance things that anybody can do even me. So we're going to start talking about tires. Um, one of the simple things that you need to do when you're paying attention to your tires is torque the wheels, especially after they've been rotated. Um, anytime that a wheel has been off the coach, there's a potential for expansion and contraction to happen with the aluminum. And uh, if you retorque them after about 100 miles, you should not have any more problems. They will come loose in the first 100 miles. Okay, so how do you retorque them? Okay. On your invoice from the tire manuf or sorry, the uh, individual that redid your tires or rotated your tires, you will have a torque spec that they placed the wheels at. You should confirm that uh, with a torque wrench, and you will. Most torque wrenches have a dial indicator on them or a pin gauge. Uh, so when you get to that torque, it will click, or you will see the number that you're looking for. Uh, for example, if you're set to 100 pounds. Once you got to 100 foot-pounds, it would click and you would know you to stop. And there's a special wrench we need for that? Yeah, you require a half-inch drive torque wrench, and capable that, of reaching at least 125 foot-pounds. And that has a level or it has a gauge or a meter it on yeah, it? Yeah, the torque wrench comes complete with the gauge. That is that is in every torque wrench. We all should carry that? Yes. Because absolutely. if we don't... You could end up losing a wheel and you're going to have some problems. It's not going to be a nice trip. So let's move into plumbing a little bit. Lots of questions about plumbing. Uh, some, is there any maintenance we should perform in, in the bathroom with that yeah. plumbing system? Exactly. So your coach is normally parked and left unattended for an extended period of time. Um, we can't control what happens with the sun and the interior temperatures of your coach become very hot. Uh, what happens at that point is a lot of times the water will start to evaporate and as that happens the P-traps get empty. Once that happens all of the odors that are in the tanks below can permeate your vehicle. So about once a month you should be washing your drains, your P-traps, flushing them with water and making sure that there's always liquid in them, otherwise your coach will begin to smell. All right, walk us through this again. How on earth do we flush and wash our P-trap? Okay, so it <laughs> that sounds, sounds terrible. Why do they call it P? Well, I won't go there. Well, it's actually, it's because it looks like the shape of a P. Oh, no, it's not because yeah, it's, it's not in be the toilet. It's not it? because it's in the okay, toilet. Okay, so we got that cleared up, yeah. but how do you clean the P-trap? The maintenance that you can do is to actually run water knowingly through the P-trap. Uh, so if your coach is going to be left sitting for an extended period of time, you want to wash down anything that would be evaporating in that and run fresh water through it. So you can do that through a garden hose, you can start up your water system if your coach is, is, is available, has water available to it. You can just open up the taps and start the pump and let fresh water go down the drains. Once you do that, you exchange the water that's in there and run that other stuff down into the gray tank or the black tank. Uh, that then puts fresh water in the system and allows it so that you're not gonna have any odors coming back up. Now, what Very is, simple. One of the other problems that many people report on every kind of RV is the sensors. And uh, as we look at what a sensor really is, there's not much that can go wrong with the sensor. No. Then why is it that they're never accurate? Okay, so the sensors are exactly as you said. There are very little that can actually go wrong with them. The problem becomes that they read voltage and the method or medium that they use to send that voltage back up to the little monitor panel is the liquid that's in the tank. So anything that can build up and coat those sensors limits the amount of electricity that can get back to the next sensor in the level indicator or prevents it from getting wet. So quite often you'll see, especially with the black tank, any papers or, uh, that have gone down will actually coat the sensors and prevent any liquid from getting to it. So what we recommend you do is put a little bit of Calgon type soap, like a dish detergent type powdered soap. Calgon type. Calgon, yep. yes. Um, 
uh, and fill the tank to about two thirds or three quarters. Put a bag of ice cubes, about two and a half pound or five pound bag of ice cubes down there. Toilet, run the vehicle around, going back and forth, causing the ice cubes to swirl around in the tank, banging off the sensors and cleaning them up. Um, if you do this on a fairly regular basis, you shouldn't have any issues. If your coach has been left unattended for a long period of time, I would recommend doing a two-stage. First would be to soak everything, let everything sit overnight with a full, full of just fresh water, um, and then go through the process with the Calgon and break it up, everything that is now free and, and moist. And that will, and how often we sh should we do that? Uh, that depends on how long you store your coach for. Any time that you store your coach, you should prep that before putting it away. So I would recommend in the spring and in the fall, um, or uh, depending on your usage, you might feel necessary to do it a little bit more often. When you go to a campsite, somebody who has a, uh, a waste uh, a system that is not a macerator, uh, I'll see those, uh, you know, they'll have the, the drain hose running to the dump uh, in the, at the campsite. Yeah. Is that a good idea? No, it's not. Um, the reason that it's not a good idea is because when you leave the gate valve open, all of the liquid is allowed to flow out of the tank and unfortunately the solids remain because they need the liquid to move, to move them. So your tank ends up being built up with solids that aren't evacuated from the tank when you do that. Common practice would be to let your tank get to about two thirds to three thirds full again, or full, um, and then flush the tank by removing the, or opening the gate valve. That means that all of the liquids and solids will move out together and your tank will become empty. And when you just leave that hose always hooked up, it's just the liquid that's going out. Correct. It doesn't, the solids remain sitting in the tank. That and would explain move. why a lot of people have odor. Yeah. Well, let's move on from plumbing and uh, talk about uh, the propane system a little bit. Uh, one of the things you talked about uh, is spiders, and I think that's something that people need to know about. Okay. So spiders have a tendency to love the smell of propane. They will build a nest in any location where they get the odor of propane. So uh, one of the most common areas uh, is the propane regulator and the propane regulator is basically a diaphragm with pressure on one side from your propane and atmosphere pressure on the other side. When they build their nest on the diaphragm area it prevents it from seeing atmospheric pressure and your regulator cannot function any longer. So you'll see things like a very yellow flame or a high flame if the, if the diaphragm was moved out when the propane or when the nest was built on it and it's going to cause you all kinds of problems. They will build nests in the vents for your heater systems. They'll build it in the propane fire section for your hot water tank. All of these things need to be prevented. I personally use steel wool in any of the locations that I have access to to prevent that from happening and unfortunately with a, with a regulator the only thing you can do is either wrap it or clean it in the spring. As we uh, talk about other common things people will, will mention, uh, the plumbing system in terms of the kitchen faucet and even sometimes the lavatory uh, faucet, sometimes that water flow is not very strong. Right. What do you do? Uh, why is that? Okay, so there's a couple of different reasons. I'm going to break it down into two, point, two components. The first one, um, if you're using the water pump that comes equipped in your vehicle and you find that this is happening, there could be a couple of issues. One being the strainer prior to the water pump is starting to get dirty. It's capturing the dirt that comes in in the water or any sediment that's in your tank and preventing a good solid flow going into the pump. As a result, you don't get good pressure coming and out. We f and we find that strainer in with the water pump. It's right on the side of the water pump. It's on the inlet to the water pump. So you it's right beside the water pump. Um, just and unscrew some, it, right? Just unscrew it. There is a rubber gasket inside. Make sure that you don't pinch that or cut it because then you'll have a problem with air getting into it. However, uh, it's very straightforward. The gasket does not come out uh, very easily, so for most people it does not present a problem. Just be cognizant of it. So that's at the water pump. What about at the, at the kitchen faucet or the lavatory faucet? All right. So um, this problem would present itself regardless of how you're getting your water pressure coming into the coach. So if, you have, uh, if you're hooked up to a garden hose and you're getting a city water connection and you still experience a low water flow coming out of your kitchen tap but not your bathroom tap, there's a strainer on it or an aerator on the tap. That would come out and you would clean the screen there 
and that would allow you to get full flow again. We met something that we could should do every year, or maybe yes. maybe a little often if we maybe use it. a little bit more often. One of the individuals that was in our owner's training school had mentioned hard water. Hard water has an impact on that kind of stuff, and will form calcium buildups on that screen. And as a result, they require far more cleaning than somebody that has soft water. A couple of issues about battery. People often say that their battery is uh, losing its charge. And you talked uh, at some length about parasitic drains. Explain that and what is the most common source of a parasitic drain? We think we got all the appliances off, but we're still losing battery power. How come? Okay. So parasitic drain in today's chassis is evident in uh, the technology that we use. So every vehicle has three components automatic transmission module, a body control module, and an engine control module. Now, in order for those vehicles to maintain that memory um, of how you drive, what the vehicle was last stored at, and any uh, codes that the engine may notice, there has to be a certain amount of power that comp continues to, sur to supply those items. Um, so every coach has a significant amount of battery drain on it as a parasitic drain. Even when we're doing nothing. Even we're when we're doing draining, nothing. Even sitting there. Okay. Even sitting there. So if you read your owner's manuals for the Sprinter and for the ProMaster, both of them have a battery disconnect that's supplied with the coach for easy use. And this would apply to other RVs as well. Absolutely. Like trailers, everything. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything that has a... Uh, module that would have a memory in it will have this parasitic draw, including your radio. Uh, all your presets require something there to store them and they currently use the, the chassis battery for that. So each of these chassis that we have actually has a built-in battery disconnect system that makes it so you don't require any tools in order to do so. If you're storing the coach, they recommend every 21 days. Because we add additional items to that that require memory, we recommend every two weeks if you're going to store the vehicle for more than two weeks. All right, so that's parasitic drain with the, with the chassis. Um, what about battery loss? Uh, many people say, I'm not doing anything, but I'm losing uh, voltage in my battery. What's the most common cause of that inside the coach? Inside your coach, you've got a number of items that will draw power whether you're aware of it or not. And unfortunately, one of these items, or fortunately one of these items is the antenna booster. When the antenna booster is on, it is basically your highest draw of 12 volt power in your coach. So if that's left on, it will drain the batteries uh, at a quicker rate than normally than the last time you were out. And all it takes, unfortunately, for that to happen is somebody putting something in a cabinet and pushing the button by accident or not realizing it's on. And the last thing you mentioned is uh, the importance of hands-on. And you're a big advocate of washing your vehicle yourself and, and uh, cleaning it up. And besides the fact that it makes the vehicle look better and maintains it better, What's another reason that you want to have us put our hands on that vehicle? So anytime that you actually physically wash your vehicle or put your hands on your vehicle, you identify with a change, a change from the last time you washed it, a change from the last time you looked at something closely. For example, if you're washing the grill down and you look in behind and you notice that uh, you took a stone into the radiator and your fins are all bent, that repair is now something that's not going to be a cause for you to break down later. So my reasoning for having your hands-on approach to your coach is that you're cognizant of evidence of, of something happening in the future. You may be preventing that breakdown that's going to waste your time when you're on your trip. How many of the problems that you guys see people call in uh, with uh, you know various issues, hatches and all of this stuff, how many of them are are handled if people would just be a little more familiar with the user manual for their RV? A significant number of them are, I would say, over 50% of our calls in and items that we're dealing with could be prevented by preventative maintenance and being hands-on. Adjustment of latches and catches, proper adjustment will prevent hinges from being pulled out, uh, stop doors from slamming and cracking, um, that kind of stuff. Preventative maintenance on your tires and uh, noticing that kind of stuff will give you indications that there's something else wrong, maybe with your front end. Uh, that, once again, prevents you from breaking down when you're out on the road. So that's what we don't want. That's what we don't want. We want happy camping, and the easiest way to do that is through preventative maintenance. So there you go. I really can do all that preventative maintenance. I'm not such an unhandy handyman after all. 
I want to thank Sean from the Irwinheimer Group of North America for making time to actually walk us through all of those little projects. I hope they helped you as much as they helped me. I'm Mike Wendland. I want to ask you to do one thing before you quit watching, and that is to subscribe to our RV Lifestyle channel right here on YouTube.